Hello everyone, my name is Baram Jalali of the Jalali Lab at UCLA, and it's my pleasure to provide you with an overview of advanced real-time measurement techniques. My co-authors are Daniel Solly, Klaus Ropers, Georg Herring, Tian Jung, and Serge Bielowski. This conference is all about real-time measurements and single-shot phenomena. Shannon's information theory tells us that the amount of information gained in a measurement is inversely proportional to how well the results could have been predicted. In other words, difficult to capture or flash-like signals contain far more information than repetitive waveforms. At the same time, these are the most difficult signals to measure. The photonic time switch data acquisition technique has emerged as the most successful solution to single shot measurements of transient events. And this talk will review the numerous applications of time switch in scientific, biomedical, and industrial applications. The talk is organized as follows. Uh, we will first hear a historical perspective on the evolution of science and the important role of instruments in that evolution. We will then review the challenges in real-time measurements imposed by information theory, and then the data acquisition bottleneck and how time stretch solves that will be discussed. We then will look at the scientific landmarks enabled by the time stretch technique as well as instruments for biomedical diagnostics, light scattering, and LIDAR with the same technique. We will then conclude with closing remarks. It's often said that necessity is a mother of invention. It can also be said that uh, the instrument is the mother of science. The history of science uh, is full of sprints where a burst of progress in science is made following a breakthrough in, in instrumentation technology. Uh, as a case study, we can look at the telescope. Uh, the invention of the telescope, um, allegedly by Galileo, led to careful measurements of celestial bodies and the discovery that the orbits of planet, planets are actually elliptical. Um, this in turn led to the theory of gravitation based on the inverse square law by Isaac Newton and uh, Robert Hooke. In the early days, uh, before we had um, good instruments to measure and quantify things, and before we had mathematical tools to model them, science was empirical. These empirical laws were formed by trial and error, by collecting as much data as possible. And these laws were a mixture of reality and also superstition. Uh, for example, all sailors believe that if you set sail on a Friday, you will be lost at sea. So no ship would um, start its journey on a Friday. Uh, these beliefs, beliefs were data-driven. Uh, perhaps they were based on insufficient data, but they were, they were data-driven. Uh, they were not based on science. In the last couple of centuries, we invented uh, great instruments for measuring things with high accuracy, and we developed mathematical tools to model that data using first principles. So science evolved from empirical to deterministic, as exemplified by the Newtonian mechanics. Now, thanks to the semiconductor industry, in the last couple of decades, there has been an exponential rise in our ability to store data and to perform computation on that data. And this has led to the rise of neural networks as black box empirical models, which when given enough data and compute power, uh, they can fit virtually any data and extract subtle patterns from it. So we've come a full circle from empirical to deterministic and now back to empirical. Now this trend underscores the crucial role of instruments to acquire physical that is analog phenomena and convert them into digital data that could be processed using um, AI and other algorithms. So advanced instruments are indeed needed to take advantage of AI. 
One of the exciting emerging fields as it relates to AI is the use of neural networks to learn partial differential equations that govern the underlying physics. So this is an example of the emerging symbiosis between physics and AI. And to be sure, to learn new physics, we need advanced instruments to generate data of new phenomena. So the papers presented in this conference are very much in line with this exciting emerging field. Now, all instruments generate data. However, it's not the data that matters, but the information in the data. And it's instructive to remind ourselves that data is not necessarily information. Uh, Shannon tells us that the amount of information is inversely proportional to the probability of its occurrence. So the more likely an, an event is, or the more unlikely that is, the higher its information content. The problem is the same as the proverbial needle in a haystack. And the, this becomes especially difficult if the needle we're trying to detect is an ultra-fast event. Uh, detecting these ultra-fast events require real-time instruments with high time resolution, but also with long record lengths. The traditional pump and probe instruments cannot do the job because they operate in equivalent time, not in real time. One of the main bottlenecks in real-time single-shot data acquisition is the digitizer, otherwise known as the A to D converter. While at Bell Labs in the late 1980s and early 90s, I had designed and demonstrated some of the fastest electronic circuits for optical communication. And after coming to UCLA in the in early 90s, I got a research contract from um, HRL at the time used to stand for Hughes Research Lab to design a two gigasound per second, eight, eight bit electronic A to D converter. At the time, this would have been or was the state of the art. And I, that's when I learned about the fundamental trade-off between the speed and resolution of an A to D converter of a digitizer. Basically the dynamic range as measured by the effective number of bits or ENOB goes down at higher frequencies. For the fastest digitizers, the performance is limited by the jitter of the sampling clock and by the switching speed of the transistors in the comparator. The fundamental limit is set by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But uh, so far these days, we are far away from that. Uh, that project led to the idea of the time stretch data acquisition described uh, in a patent file in 1998. The patent put forward two ideas. One is that uh, real-time data conversion can be achieved via manipulating a time scale in the analog domain. This included time stretch for A to D conversion and time compression for D to A conversion. The second idea was that um, how to implement such systems using a hybrid optical front end and electronic back end. For example, for time stretching and A to D conversion, uh, the pattern described using sharp pulse modulation followed by dispersive propagation and then quantization in the electronic domain at much lower speed. Now, by slowing down the data before the electronic digitizer, time stretch solves the dynamic range speed trade-off that we just saw. So it effectively overcomes the limits imposed by the jitter in the sampling clock and by the switching speed of the transistors in the comparator. And uh, in fact, uh, effective jitters as low as five femtoseconds are typical in time stretch data acquisition techniques. By um, 
So in the time shift systems, the information of interest is first modulated on the spectrum of a supercontinuum pulse, or it may already reside there. Then that information is, uh, which is represented by the envelope, is slowed down using dispersive elements. So while this reduces the speed of the envelope and the information, it also decreases the signal power because the energy is conserved and is spread over longer times. And this results in a loss of sensitivity. So by itself, it will be quite difficult to do single shot measurements at uh, high, high sensitivity. Now, it turns out that um, around the same times we were working on these problems in the other half of our lab, we were doing a lot of work on stimulated Raman effect in silicon to enable silicon to amplify light and eventually to create a laser. So we decided to combine the stimulated Raman work and the time stretch to solve the problem mentioned in the previous slide. So in the so-called amplified time stretch, the dispersive medium is pumped by high power lasers to induce uh, stimulated Raman scattering. And here the signal is not only slowed down, but also amplified uh, to enable high sensitivity. So we should note that the Raman amplification is a distributed effect and hence it has the lowest noise figure possible. In fact, a lower or much lower than what could be achieved with a lumped element amplifier, such as an EDFA. So it's a natural amplification choice for uh, time stretch systems. And uh, this uh, allows us to achieve high sensitivity and high speed single shot detection with limb, very low laser power and uh, to avoid damage to the sample. And uh, this uh, was a key in the success of the imaging instruments that we'll see later that have been successful de for detection of cancer cells in blood. So our time stretch technology has been behind a growing number of milestones in nonlinear optical dynamics and in uh, new imaging and sensing instruments including those for biomedical applications that have been developed at UCLA and elsewhere. So in this talk, we will review most of uh, these instruments. In the next section, we will quickly mention some of the landmark demonstrations in real-time measurements made possible by the time stage technique. Here, I should mention that uh, this talk may unintentionally give more coverage to the results, results from UCLA, where the early time stretch research was done. But the time stretch instrumentation has become a sizable field, and many groups around the world are doing amazing work, including many of our lab's alumni who are now in academia. Back in 2008, 2009 timeframe, a company called Gigoptics had made the first commercial 100 gigahertz electro-optic modulator. However, they had no way to test it at such speed. So they brought the device to UCLA to be tested by the time stretch oscilloscope. The results shown here is the modulator output at 108 gigahertz measured in real time. Uh, these results were presented at OFC 2010. A major landmark was the discovery of optical rogue waves uh, reported in 2007. Uh, these are spontaneous flashes of light that follow extreme value distribution, otherwise known as heavy tail or power law distributions. The ability to perform tabletop experiments under control conditions led to the understanding of the origin of this interesting phenomenon and the concept of uh, stimulated supercontinuum generation which is a method for creating a stable white light using picosecond pulses. Uh, this work fueled, uh, has fueled many diverse studies by several groups around the world, in particular, uh, John Dudley, Neil Akhmadiev, and Gori Genti have made uh, significant contributions 
to the understanding of this rogue wave phenomena. Modlac lasers have been around for a long time and uh, are the main tool in attosecond uh, time domain spectroscopy and in metrology using frequency combs. However, the emergence of a modlac event is singular and non repetitive and had never been studied or observed until just a few years ago. The first observation of the birth of mode locking showed that complex and elegant dynamics that accompany the transition from CW free running state to a mode lock stable state are uh, producing extremely uh, stable from the second pulses, uh, how that process happens. Uh, solitons can exert uh, both attractive and repulsive forces on each other despite the lack of Coulomb charge. Uh, they do this through the nonlinearity of the medium. Uh, they can form complexes uh, that are known as soliton molecules. Now, single shot interferometry using time switch has made it possible to watch the formation of these uh, complexes showing the binding and dissociation of the bonds, soliton bonds. For example, the results shown here uh, describe how the distance, in other words, the orbit, changes in quantized steps during a transition from an unbound state to a stable bound state. This work also has fueled uh, many studies by several groups around the world. Now led by pioneering work of Serge Bielowski and his colleagues at the University of Lille in France, time stretch A to D conversion has found application to electron beam diagnostics in synchrotrons and uh, free electron lasers. In the landmark 2015 paper, uh, the group showed single shot measurements of the evolution of relativistic electron complexes at the Soleil uh, synchrotron facility in Paris. Uh, they did this by real time measurements of the electric field that is generated when electrons form bunches. The bunching is a nonlinear effect that results from the interaction of the electron with its own wake field. Another milestone work from France was the tracking of single laser induced shock waves using the Raman amplified version of the time stretch imaging. We'll talk about time stretch imaging more later. Uh, the group was able to monitor uh, the slowing down of a single shock wave and its reflection from the plane boundaries and also capture the statistics that originate from the fluctuations in the shock wave and in the interactions. Uh, this work has uh, direct applications to laser ablation. One of the dream applications of time stretch has been to observe what happens during a combustion event. Uh, this truly impressive work reported by Lalonde and uh, his co-workers at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and the Nevada National Security Site did that for the first time. Here, they measure the transient infrared absorption spectra in gases during combustion in an acetylene oxygen gas mixture. They can measure the pressure, temperature, and gas concentrations with nanoseconds time resolution uh, for over uh, several microseconds. And they showed how the acetylene line intensities decrease and the new spectra corresponding to hydroxyl, that is OH radicals appear afterwards. The hydroxyl group is a byproduct of the combustion. Uh, the team showed uh, how they can monitor the pressure and temperature from the OH spectra, essentially producing a movie of combustion chemistry happening in real time. In the final section, we will see applications of time stretch to biomedical imaging, to light scattering, and to LIDAR for 3D imaging. I will then say just a few words on an unexpected spin off into computational imaging algorithms that are inspired by the physics of dispersive propagation, which we employ in time stretch. 
blood testing is perhaps the most common type of medical test, and it can detect many types of disease, including cancer. In a typical test, uh, we need to look at millions of cells to have statistical accuracy and to find rare disease cells among a large population of otherwise healthy cells. The blood test would be, the ideal blood test would be one where each cell can be imaged via a microscope, um, but unfortunately, uh, today's uh, cameras are not uh, fast enough. Uh, they don't have enough, the uh, fast enough shutter speed uh, to freeze the motion of the cells during flow and uh, fast enough uh, readout, readout uh, speed. Also, they cannot achieve high sensitivity during high speed. So the time stretch microscope shown here was designed to address that. So here are uh, these white balls are femtosecond laser pulses, which are diffracted into one dimensional rainbows. And these rainbows act as flashes, each taking a 1D line scan image of cells that are flowing in a microfluidic channel. The channel is in zigzag uh, in order to achieve hydrodynamic focusing. So the cells arrive in the field of view at a regular spacing. Now, when the laser pulse uh, interacts with the cell, each pixel, a spatial pixel, is mapped into a different wavelength. So the image is encoded into the wavelength. Upon reflection, the pulses come back. They are put back together and go to a circulator and enter the Raman amplifier time stretch, where each image frame is slowed down in time, but also optically amplified. So each frame can be detected in single shot and with high sensitivity without using high illumination power, which will otherwise kill the cells. And then the data is processed using uh, an FVGA. Now, the system, the first system that we built as uh, shown before, uh, we had to label the cancer cells uh, with tags that preferentially bind to the cancer cells and not to the normal cells in order to increase the contrast between the cancer and healthy cells to be able to see them. Uh, labeling the cell of cells is not uh, desirable because the, it affects the cell's native uh, behavior and uh, it could impact downstream processing such as genetic studies. So the time stretch quantitative phase imaging system shown here solves that problem. Uh, this system simultaneously acquires both blight field images and phase images. And this phase contrast technique allows the camera to see live cells, which are mostly water and hence have very low contrast. Uh, the system consists of a femtosecond laser, consists of a microscope that is uh, formed uh, in a Michelson interferometer fashion. Uh, the return signal from the flow channel consists of interferograms, which are acquired and uh, they are read in single shot with high sensitivity by sending them through the Raman amplified time stress system that detected in a single shot fashion and then the data is processed in the back end and then fed to a neural network. Uh, this combination of interferometric time stretch camera performing label free imaging of blood cells at extremely high throughputs combined with uh, deep learning neural network was considered a major advance in instrumentation and received much attention when it was published back in 2016. Now, in the original work, the signal and data processing were done in a conventional fashion. The laser interferograms were processed using um, Hilbert transform. Uh, the phase was extracted. Uh, 2D images were performed, segmented. Features were extracted from the images and then finally fed to a neural network. Uh, the system achieved very high accuracy, but the latency was high it was taking several seconds for this whole pipeline to take place. In the uh, next iteration, uh, what we did, uh, we said, 
well, if neural networks are so smart, why don't we just feed them the raw interferogram, single shot interferograms captured using the amplifier time stretch and let the neural network figure out what these are and uh, to figure out how to classify them. So we fed the raw laser pulsed interferograms, that is, directly into a very deep neural network. This is a 16 layer uh, VGG net uh, network that has been very successful for classification of uh, cats and dogs and conventional applications. But here we retrained it uh, to um, perform time stretch image processing. And then it was, we highly optimized it in order to reduce the latency. Uh, the system um, consisting of um, the time stretch phase contrast microscope and, um, and feeding the raw data into the deep neural network uh, was able to achieve very low latency when it was optimized, uh, 700 microsecond latency uh, with 96% uh, accuracy, uh, milestone performance. And then this low latency implementation of the deep neural network was developed uh, in order to enable cell sorting in which imaging and classification must be done uh, very fast before the cell leaves the flow channel. Uh, this is sometimes called uh, image activated cell sorting. Now switching to a different system, uh, me scattering is one of the main tools for characterizing particles in biological fluids and has many industrial inspection applications. Here, the angular dependence of the scattered light provides information about the size and refractive index of the particle under study. Uh, collecting the angular dependence of a scattered light is not easy. It requires a large number of detectors at various angles. However, the mismatch between the detectors distorts the angular dependence of the weak scattered light. A single detector works better, but then it will have to be mechanically scanned over the angles, and this is a very slow process. Time stretch angular scattering is a technique that uh, was introduced to measure the angular dependence of scattered light, light in a single shot fashion and with only a single detector without mechanical scanning. Here, the excitation happens at multiple angles using different wavelengths for each angle. This maps the angle into wavelengths. At the detector side, the angular dependence of scattered light then appears in the optical spectrum and is detected using time stretch in a single shot fashion. Equally important is the fact that the illumination spectrum of the laser pulse can be shaped before the particle to equalize the loss difference between the forward and side scattering and hence to equalize the dynamic range and increase the dynamic range for accurate detection. Now switching to a related topic, um, in recent years, the demand for flexible electronic devices has increased very rapidly. A non-contact material inspection is a major application of machine vision for this and other applications. For economic viability, the inspection system must have very high throughput to screen large areas of uh, substrates uh, at very high, uh, high speed. Uh, in collaboration with Hitachi, we developed what became the world's highest throughput inspection system. Uh, this um, was developed for monitoring the quality of the polymer material for flexible displays. The time stretch system used the Thai sapphire laser and a high sensitivity photo detector for measuring the light scattered by the defects in the system. And this system um, was able to detect one micron defects on a surface moving at the 7,200 RPM or equivalently at 20 meter per second uh, linear velocity. These are record performance. Now back to biomedical imaging, time stretch imaging that we saw earlier is very fast, but it cannot do fluorescence because the 
wavelength domain is used to encode the space. Um, on the other hand, because fluorescence can distinguish different molecules, it is a fundamental tool in biomedical imaging. The system shown here is a discrete implementation of time stretch imaging. In this case, the sample is illuminated by a pulsed spectral shower. Uh, these pulses, uh, the illumination is pulsed. Each pixel is a pulse. So the illumination can be amplified to high pulse energies to excite two photon fluorescent emission. The pulses are temporally sequenced. So at the receiver, the decoding can be done without needing an optical spectrometer, which would have been slow. And just by looking at the time of arrival. Also by looking at the decay of each pulse, we can capture the fluorescent lifetime and do fluorescent lifetime imaging. A key point here is that uh, the illumination pattern is digitally controlled by a pulse generator. So the illumination pattern can be can adapt and optimize for specific targets. Here we can see the system in operation performing two photon fluorescent imaging shown on the left and two photon fluorescent lifetime imaging on the right. These are done at line scan rates of 300 kilohertz, which is a record for two photon imaging. As shown in the pollen images on the right on top, the lifetime imaging is able to distinguish features that do not show up in a conventional fluorescent image because those molecules have the same fluorescent emission spectrum, but different lifetime, and they can be distinguished in lifetime imaging. Uh, that discrete time stretch system is able to do two photon imaging because it can deliver high energy pulses to each pixel and can do this fast uh, because it is spectrally scanned uh, and therefore doesn't require mechanical scanning. Uh, this same property is highly desirable in LIDAR, a device that performs 3D imaging. So we recently demonstrated uh, the first spectrally scanned time of flight LIDAR that can take very fast 3D movies. By eliminating the mechanical steering while preserving the time of flight operation, this system has achieved the fastest frame rate of any LIDAR, making it particularly suitable for 3D video and robotic applications. The illumination pattern is once again digitally co configured, so it can perform foveated imaging in which the pixel density can be configured according to the target to avoid the big data problem. And that's shown here. Here, uh, one can see point cloud images where the color is the range or the axial distance to the target. The pixel density along each dimension is about 256. Um, and the left side uh, is shows uniform illumination. The second column is uniform vision, but with two times higher pixel density, again, digitally reconfigured. The third column is foveated imaging, where the central field of view has a higher sample density than the peripheral field of view. The fourth column shows a foveated, that is non-uniform illumination in the opposite fashion, where the illumination is digitally reconfigured to assign higher sample density to the peripheral vision as opposed to the central vision. The ability to adapt the illumination, illumination pixel density that is, to the target is very useful for reducing the amount of data generated by the LiDAR to avoid the big data problem in the digital backend. As we saw, the research into time stretch instruments has evolved in many directions, spanning a wide variety of instruments and applications. Perhaps the most unexpected outcome of our nearly 25 years of research on time stretch has been a new computational imaging algorithm that emulates the physics of time stretch but does so in discrete and two-dimensional numerical domain. Uh, this is in contrast to 1D continuous time and analog domain, 
where the physical time stress system operates in. The so-called phase stretch transform, a name that uh, pays homage to time stretch, is an algorithm that emerged, has emerged as a best-in-class tool for edge and texture detection in computational imaging. Uh, again, it emulates the physics of dispersive propagation, uh, but also incorporates coherent detection to extract the phase of the dispersed waveform. Uh, we have open source this code on GitHub uh, and other open source repositories uh, where it has been extremely well received and uh, has been forked over 200 times and has been utilized for many applications, including single molecule imaging, uh, biomedical imaging, and even water treatment monitoring. Uh, these works have been done by other groups using the open source code. And that brings us to the conclusion. Uh, so we started this presentation by considering the evolution of science going from empirical to deterministic, and perhaps now going back to empirical in the age of artificial intelligence. AI techniques are data-driven and need advanced measurements to transform the physical reality into digital data. Random and single events, such as rogue waves, shock waves, relativistic electron dynamics, or rogue cancer cells, are the most important events and the most difficult to capture. Uh, since its introduction, uh, and because of its extreme throughput and ability to do continuous recording, the time stretch has been the most successful approach to solving these problems in real-time measurements and is evolving into exciting and unexpected applications. On that note, I would like to thank you very much for your attention.